All right, so this lecture is kind of a culmination of all the topics that we've kind of discussed throughout the modules. Um, remember, if you get any part of this where you're confused, uh, refer back to the original lecture. For instance, left ventricle, uh, inferior vena cava, a pulmonary edema. There's small uh, 10 to 15 minute lectures on each one of these topics. So I'm not going to uh, uh, restate a lot of that stuff, but I just kind of want to go through the method that you should go through when you're evaluating a critically ill shock patient. So essentially, the mortality rates, remember, are correlated are correlated to the duration of hypotension. So integration of bed ultrasound into the evaluation of patients with shock usually result in a more accurate and initial diagnosis with improved patient care plans. Again, view it as just as one of our senses, just like you do your physical exam, do the ultrasound to kind of help you view that. So what are the questions that we ask? Uh, just as an example, when we first started doing fo fast ultrasound exam, uh, it was a system-based approach. For instance, it said focused abdominal sonography in trauma, and then it became a problem-based approach and renamed focused assessment with, sonogra with sonography in trauma as an uh, assessment instead of just checking on the abdomen. Because what we started doing was looking for fluid in other, other areas. The same thing, when you're trying to evaluate the critically ill shock patient, you're actually evaluating a problem. The problem can be hypotension, hypoxia, fever, oligoanuria. All those are problems. The most common ones that we're going to be working on are hypoxia and hypotension. So again, remember these are point of care bedside ultrasounds. Um, our goal is to be able to perform this in the golden hour and be able to make a decision on the patient as we're doing it, as we're having a clinical management dilemma. So remember, the classifications for shock are hypovolemic, distributive, uh, cardiogenic, and obstructive. You can have a trauma, uh, hemorrhagic, uh, sepsis with distributive. You can have a myocardial infarction causing cardiogenic, and obviously pulmonary embolism <laughs> is one of the most common obstructive shocks, or even sometimes uh, mass effects of uh, tumors and stuff like that in the left ventricle. Remember, you're not only using ultrasound. You're using other things at the bedside. You're using physical findings. You're using invasive measurements. Um, in the past, we used to use uh, more PA catheters. You still have CVP available. So I'm, I'm not saying not to use any of that. You should actually use a combination of all these things to help you make a final decision on what you're going to do with your patient. So as I've shown in previous slides, <coughs> there are uh, a few studies that um, have been done that kind of help uh, a few articles that kind of show what kind of things you look for in shock. So for instance, in hypovolemic shock, you can get significantly reduced end diastolic chamber size or kissing ventricles, which I showed in the L LV module. The pulmonary embolism, so you can see clots in transit, signs of RV strain, uh, D-shaped LV, which is shown in the right ventricle lectures. You can get systolic failure, uh, is significantly reduced contraction and significantly reduced ejection fraction, uh, which is shown in the LV section. You can get tamponade through pericardial effusion. You can see right atrial systolic collapse, right ventricular diastolic collapse. And I've shown a few of those in the pericardial effusion lecture. So remember, as we go on further and further, there are more and more articles coming out talking about how important it is to be able to evaluate um, cardiac arrest in uh, using ultrasound. There are a lot of flow diagrams that have been created. This is just one of them called, called cause. There's rush, there's fate, there's feel. They're, they're all different protocols. What I suggest to you is to kind of read over a few of the uh, recommended reading articles and kind of pick and choose which way you want to actually incorporate this into your training and, and your uh, career. Remember, goal-directed echocardiography in hemodynamically unstable patients performed at the bedside by the physician caring for the patient can provide immediate critical information about the cardiovascular system that is not available by other means and actually has been shown to impact therapy in 30 to 40 percent of patients. These are just a few of the articles, but as the years go on, I, I continually see more and more articles with showing more and more impact. And part of the reading material, I have deep impact of ultrasound ICU and ultrasound, as well as a few other very good articles. What we're going to kind of go through is the RUSH protocol. The RUSH protocol, the reason why I go through it is I feel like it's easy as a learner to kind of put it in your steps. 
But remember, you can do this in any order you want, and you can do this in any method you want. But I, this is the way I recommend it. So the first thing you're going to look at is the pump. You're going to look at if there's a pericardial effusion, and not only if there's a pericardial effusion, that if there's tamponade. You're going to look at global contractility of the left ventricle. You're going to look at relative size of the right ventricle to left ventricle. Remember, refer back to the individual lectures uh, that talk about all these in one. When I talk about the tank, we're talking about the IVC size and variation with respiration. We're looking at jugular veins for collapsibility. We're looking at lung for pulmonary edema. We're looking at the pleural space for large pleural effusions. And we're looking at the abdomen for free fluid in the abdomen. There are many times I take care of trauma patients that initially the abdomen has no free fluid in it. And then on subsequent uh, evaluations, one, two, three hours later, we start seeing free fluid and can indicate uh, injury. And the last thing is the pipes, where we look at the large arteries in the veins, such as the abdominal and thoracic aorta for aneurysm and dissection. And you can look at the femoral and popliteal veins for compressibility for DVT. So as you can see, if you separate it out into these three things, and you have reviewed all the individual aspects, all the individual lectures and bedside videos that we discussed in the previous modules, you can have some sort of algorithm for yourself to kind of identify a majority of injuries in a least amount of time. So let's talk about a few of these. So first, back to the pump. When we're talking about the pump, honestly, the best way to do it is to start with a, a good peristernal long view. Once you find a good peristernal long view, you can move it to the short axis and gain a lot of information from that. But remember, we also have apical and subcostal views that can help you differentiate if you are, are unable to get a good view. Uh, some patients have very good subcostal views. For instance, patients who have COPD or emphysema have very great subcostal views. Patients who are obese, post-surgical, pregnant, they have very poor subcostal views, and you almost always have to go a little bit more uh, superior and towards the head to get a great view of the peristernal region. When we're talking about effusion around the pump, remember, we're not only talking about effusion, we're talking about is the effusion causing a tamponade. Some of the hallmarks of tamponade are right ventricular free wall inversion, best recognized during diastole, right atrial inversion during systole, more common in early finding. We can also look at the mitral and aortic inflow velocities and a dilated inferior vena cava. Although remember, the three that we can probably be best at is the looking at the right ventricle and looking at the dilated inferior vena cava and looking at, looking at the right atrial inversion. Here's a picture showing right ventricular collapse in a patient with tamponade. The next thing you can look for is squeeze of the pump. Refer back to the le left ventricle lecture to see all the images to be able to calculate poor, normal, or hyperdynamic function. Remember, you're not quantifying anything. You're just looking at this as a qualitative measure. And remember, in previous studies, ejection fractions showed that radionuclide imaging and visual determination are roughly equivalent. Remember, when you're commenting on this, when the patient is hypotensive or hypoxic or in shock, all you're trying to determine is, is, is the patient have, does the patient have good contractility, hyperdynamic contractility, or poor contractility? Remember, in good contractility, the walls almost come together and almost obliterate the ventricular cavity during systole. In poor contractility, the walls move little and the heart may be even dilated. And we're looking at this in the peristernal short papillary muscle level. You can actually even look for segmental wall motion abnormalities. If you see that there is poor function, sometimes you can see that there is poor anterior or inferior function, and this can lead you to the diagnosis that the patient may be hypotensive due to myocardial infarction. In specifically in cardiac arrest, you can actually look at ultrasound to see if there's a presence or absence of cardiac contractions. Also, if they're present, you may even have you may also look for coordinated movements of the mitral and aortic valves. If there is not coordinated movements, you may still need to com continue doing chest compressions. Also, if it's absent, if you have cardiac standstill after prolonged ACLS, the, the chance for uh, return to spontaneous circulation is very low 
and you may be able to use that to stop uh, resuscitation. Next, when you're looking at the right ventricle, remember, you can look at the strain of the pump. You can look at the size of the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. Normally, it should be about a half or 0.6. So if you see the right ventricle approaching the size of the left ventricle, especially if you've done the ultrasound on a patient before, within a day or two days ago, and now you see it that the right ventricle is acutely enlarged, that may lead you to a diagnosis of a strain of the pump, either through a pulmonary embolism or acute uh, pulmonary hypertension from many other causes. Remember, the apical view is optimal for this. It is also one of the more difficult views to get in the intensive care unit. You can also look for RV dilation, an acute pressure rise in the pulmonary circuit, for, such as a large pulmonary embolism, embolism can cause this. You can also look for interventricular septum shifts from right to left, uh, which I talked about it makes a D sign. You can look for strain of the pump. So this is the right ventricle dilated. Sometimes you ask yourself if this was a gradual increase. Uh, sometimes you can see that if you see thickening or hypertrophy of the RV wall. Usually an acute is thin. So that goes through some of the pump uh, questions. So let's go through the next step, which is looking at the tank. So remember, when you're looking at the tank, I actually start with the lungs. If the patient is in shock, hypotensive or hypoxic, and I see bilateral pulmonary edema pattern or pulmonary edema pattern, that indicates to me that no matter what the heart is doing, that the heart is not able to keep up with fluid in the body. does not mean that I would give Lasix or do something different. It just means that I may be judicious in my fluid resuscitation. So for this ultrasound, you're only going to be looking at the anterior wall. Remember, we're looking for B-lines. B-lines arise from fluid air artifacts and give hyperechoic patterns and up, up to a completely diffuse white pattern, which I've seen in patients with, with massive acute pulmonary edema, usually patients who come in the morning from known heart failure. So remember, B-profile are bilateral anterior B-lines that have lung sliding. That e equals pulmonary edema. Don't confuse this with patients who have no lung sliding. No lung sliding can be seen in ARDS or bilateral pneumonia. And so you can trick yourself if you don't look for the sliding. So here are some signs of B lines. So you can see here's a few, one B line, here's a few B lines, here's a lot more B lines, and here's a whole massive whiteout. You can actually see your treatment if, you, if you're suspecting pulmonary edema from heart failure. You can actually do your treatment, either positive pressure ventilation, diuretics and or vasodilators and you can actually see these lines get less so I recommend you do that to confirm to yourself what what uh, B lines actually look like here's an image here's a clip of a patient with B lines as the chest wall moves you can see that the lung is sliding now again if you're not able to see this clearly from this depth you can actually zoom in on the pleura and kind of make the gain less bright and you can actually see the sliding much better. Here's an image of A lines and B lines just to give you a brief review. Remember A lines are horizontal. So if you had a cardiogenic shock or hypoxic patient such as this, you would probably be okay to give more fluid if you're looking at this in the both anterior and lateral areas. This is the B line we just looked at. So remember, vertical lines are B, horizontal lines are A lines. The tank also includes looking at the inferior vena cava. Uh, if you remember, the inferior vena cava can collapse, and you're looking for IVC collapsibility. If you're unsure and you can't see this from the three second clip, you can actually put an M mode on the patient, and you can see the inferior vena cava, and you can see as the patient is getting breaths either mostly if they're making spontaneous breaths, you can see a collapse. Remember, if, this, if they're on mechanical ventilation and you're providing the breaths, they're not they're positive pressure, not spontaneous, then the IVC actually increases in size. So for me, when I look at the inferior vena cava, I'm actually looking more at the absolute size than the collapsibility. I find that to be a little bit better predictor and more close to CVP.
Remember, CVP is not great either, but if you look at all this in a combination, it can actually help you out and make you a little bit more confident in your decision-making process. So what I look at is I actually look and see if I have a small IVC versus a large IVC. If I have a small IVC and everything else goes towards the patient probably needs some fluid, I actually repeat my inferior vena cava exam maybe every 20-30 minutes or right after I give the fluid bolus to see if I see a response. If I see a response, for instance, the IVC goes from 1.4 centimeters to 1.6 or 1.7 centimeters, then I know my liter of fluid actually helped the situation, especially if I see an improvement in my vital signs. So remember, the times where you cannot use this is if you have the patient on vasodilators or you've given diuretics, and positive pressure ventilation really changes the collapsibility problem. So remember, bedside evaluation is most accurate when it's small and collapses. It's better to follow the changes over time in IVC response to fluid. You can actually also use the jugular veins in a similar fashion. Uh, for instance, if I have the patient in Trendelenburg and I see the internal jugular is collapsing and very small, it almost confirms to me that the patient is volume down. It doesn't mean that they need fluid. It could also mean that they just recently received Lasix but it, it gives me an idea. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about, so now we've talked about the pump, the tank, is the pipe. So someone's hypotensive, and you've went through your other two steps, and you don't see anything large, then you may want to look into the pipes. The pipes, I mean by aorta and a DVT. So remember, if you have an aortic aneurysm, some cases present with shock as the only finding. The traditional postile mass is the fastest way, but the, sens but the sensitivity and specificity is very poor. Ultrasound is rapid, accurate, it's non-invasive, it's inexpensive, and it's reproducible, and it can be done at the bedside. So remember, if you, if, when you're, you are doing the aorta evaluation, you need to evaluate from the epigastric all the way down to the iliac bifurcation. The circular vessel immediately anterior to the vertebral body. It's left of the paired IVC. You want to do outer wall to outer wall. Uh, the greater than three centimeters is abnormal. And a thrombus and rupture are harder to visualize. Here you see an ultrasound image where the ultrasound probe was placed right on top of the ab abdomen, right in the epigastric region. You can see that the aneurysm is fairly large. Normally, it's sometimes even difficult to find the aorta. If you find it difficult to find the aorta, they most likely don't have an aneurysm. And remember, you, can, you may have gas in the way, and you may need to use slow and steady pressure to be able to see the aorta. This is a, a thrombus, sometimes hard to see. This is a flap, but you can also find those. But more importantly, remember, after you've done the entire course evaluation, you could have some retroperitoneal bleeding that is not visualized well on the ultrasound. But if you have a triple A in hypotension, you really should consider that the patient has a rupture and plan for what you would do for that. So remember, you should evaluate for dissection, but it has very poor sensitivities. The aortic root dilation and aortic in intimal flap, look for that. In the personal long axis, sometimes you can see the aortic root, and if it's greater than 3.8 centimeters, that's abnormal. This is where you see the aortic outflow tract. The suprasternal view is placed in the suprasternal notch, but honestly for me that's been a very difficult view to get. And color flow can sometimes help. The last thing I want to talk about is DVTs. So let's say you have the patient that's hypotensive, questionable right ventricle to left ventricle size. Well, you can actually do a limited lower extremity ultrasound exam, and if you see a, a clot, it may indicate to you that even though you don't see the right ventricular you cannot measure the right ventricular pressure easily, that you may have a, um, a clot, and the treatment is similar whether you have a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, is heparin infusion. So this is a very good skill to have, especially for patients who cannot leave the, leave the unit or leave the emergency room for instability. So remember, a majority of pulmonary embolism do arise from the lower extremity. Simple compression ultrasound has good sensitivity. You have incomplete compression of anterior and posterior portions of the vein. And complicated Doppler techniques really add little utility. Remember, though, if you do see a clot, you should order a, a, a 
an ultrasound from the radiology department because a more an official ultrasound they do do uh, more sophisticated techniques and may catch smaller thrombi. So this was the study done by Bernetti and others that showed that a two point and a D-dimer was just as good as a whole leg color flow Doppler. But remember, we do three point where we look at the common femoral, we look at the greater saphenous takeoff, we look at the deep and uh, superficial femoral takeoff, and we look at the popliteal. So again, the proximal femoral vein is just evaluated just first below the inguinal ligament. The scanning should continue down to the bifurcation and into the deep and superficial femoral areas. The second area is the popliteal fossa. Now remember, I didn't show you a lot of videos in this lecture. The point was I wanted to go through uh, uh, step one, step two, and step three, a rush protocol for evaluation for hypotension. But recall that you can almost use any protocol, and I wanted to show you kind of like a stepwise approach that people use. Uh, if you want any more information or more videos, remember each one of the things I discuss has a 15 to 20 minute uh, lecture with some bedside videos associated. So that should help you out to figure this out, to figure out how you would do the plan. Also, just because I talked about the rush protocol or other protocols doesn't mean that's the same method that you should use. What I recommend is that you get uh, really good with the individual applications. And then when you have normal patients, act as if they are hypotensive and what you would do, what process you would go through. For instance, for myself, I start with the lungs. I look for pulmonary edema. If I don't see uh, beelines sliding on both sides, I immediately ask for 500 cc's of saline on a pressure bag because that helps me evaluate the rest of the rest of the exam. As the nurse or whoever is getting set up for that, I start looking at the heart. I look at the heart in a personal long view. I get a really I, I spend a little bit extra time and get a really good personal long view. <laughs> Once you get a personal long view, you can identify if you have a large pericardial effusion or some right ventricular collapse. I change immediately to short axis. I angle it to the papillary muscle level, and I try to identify if the function is poor, normal, or hyperdynamic. If the function is hyperdynamic, I continue with the fluid bolus. Even if the function is poor, I do continue with the fluid bolus because I want to see if the patient's hypotension is improved or tachycardia and hypotension is improved. Then after that, I immediately go to the right upper quadrant and I look for free fluid in the belly. After I look for free fluid in the belly, if there's none, if there is free fluid in the belly and I wasn't expecting it, uh, for instance, it was not an ascites patient, uh, then I immediately try to make arrangements for why the patient may have uh, fluid in the belly. Then I look at, I immediately move to the inferior vena cava area. So by then my 500 cc of fluid have been running and as I'm seeing the fluid bolus go on a pressure bag, I can sometimes even look at the IVC and see it collapsing or not collapsing or getting improved. And I, I mentally document or, or, or check and see how big the IVC is. And then after the fluid bolus or after the another 500 cc of fluid bolus, I repeat the exam as well as the vital sign monitoring. And then I add in all the other areas and I will repeat the lung exam and the heart exam because now I know where I got the best exam the first time I did it. And I'll repeat this exam every 15-20 minutes until the patient's out of a shock or I have a reason. At that point, uh, if you're still concerned, you can look at the aorta, you can look for DVT, you can look a little bit closer at the different heart views to see if you're missing a right ventricular problem. Um, but that will actually give you a good uh, indication of what's going on. All right, thanks a lot.